Hi there, guys. So we are heading towards our second last chapter. In chapter 8, we're working with aerobic digestion, sometimes called the activated sludge process. The activated sludge just referred to the biomass that's performing the job of cleaning the water from subs the substances that contain a lot of carbon. So uh, you can go through the chapter and see what we're doing. But I just want to start with, I don't know if you've ever uh, went out for fishing. And what you might have noticed, you've got a bucket. You've got a bucket and you you might caught a big fish. You put it in one bucket and you catch a few small fishes and you put it, put it in another bucket. And then, you know, what happens is sometimes these fishes aren't happy when you put them in the bucket. And it's like they, their mouths open and they're like, they're very uncomfortable. And you will see that it happens to the big one. Well, the small ones will be pretty happy swimming around, no problem. Okay, now if you were able to measure the dissolved oxygen concentration, you get a probe for that, you will see that the dissolved oxygen concentration for the big fish is much lower than the dissolved oxygen concentration for these two small fishes. So what's happening is oxygen mass transfer is something that um, is really driven by a process that makes bubbles. You've got to make small bubbles. You've got to agitate. In this bucket example, you will only have a film that's fairly stagnant. There's be a, there'll be a bit of movement, and that will basically cause some transfer of oxygen from the atmosphere to the liquid. That rate will be fixed unless you disturb that surface. But if you don't disturb that surface, you or bubble anything through the water, you're going to have a fixed rate of oxygen transfer. Um, and then what happens is the big fish obviously requires much more oxygen than the two small fishes combined. And if you start using that oxygen, you are now using up what's in the water and now more's got to get replaced. Okay. And that replacement rate is such that it might not be fast enough. And if it's not fast enough, your oxygen concentration in the liquid will drop and the fish will suffer. For the two small fishes, you will only be using a little bit of oxygen. And whatever oxygen you use, if you compare it to the rate that you can replace oxygen via mass transfer, you will find that the fishes stay happy and that the dissolved oxygen concentration in the liquid remains relatively high, making the fishes happy. Now, it's exactly the same with bioreactors. Let's move on to the next slide. So we always work with CX, our microbial biomass that's driving the whole process. And we typically grow it so it becomes more. So we distinguish between a high CX system and a low CX system. Okay, if you don't have a lot of cells in there, your oxygen, and we should talk about the volumetric oxygen demand, the volumetric oxygen demand will be less, even though each cell in the mixture might contain a certain amount of oxygen. You've got to know that you multiply with the cellular concentration to get the volumetric requirement. So as cells grow, more cells form, and the volumetric requirement from those cells for oxygen becomes more. And now you have a process of supplying oxygen, but that supply of oxygen will be fixed by a certain constant. I'll show you the equations now. And then you start running into interesting scenarios, which you will see in the tub that you are almost ready to perform. So the governing equations are fairly simple. Okay, The gas transfer coefficient, gas liquid mass transfer coefficient is a constant. It will be supplied. Okay. That, that's a function of how big the sparger is, how fast it exits. You can design different spargers, but once you have a sparger design, sparger is just the thing that makes bubbles in the mixture, you have a fixed KLA. Now, important that the rate of mass transfer of oxygen is given by the driving force between the saturation concentration and the concentration in the reactor. Important guys, you know about Henry's law, so any gas can only dissolve to a certain extent in a liquid. That's called the saturation concentration. For oxygen, you'll see the value, it's about 7 milligram a litre in the notes. For oxygen, you can't dissolve more, you saturate it. 
Okay, so the concentration in the reactor will always be less than or close to saturation. It will vary somewhere between zero and full saturation. That's why we like to talk about the oxygen saturation. We just check the concentration of oxygen and divide it by the saturation. This gives us a fraction that's very indicative of where the system is at. If that fraction is big, if the O2 saturation is 99%, it really means that whatever is required, what's taking up oxygen, it's not really hindering the supply. The supply is much faster than the uptake. Therefore, the concentration of O will remain very high. Okay. But then, of course, you get the scenario where there's a lot of microbes in the mixture and they now have a big volumetric supply and you might get restricted by this equation. Okay, so what will happen if mass transfer becomes an issue, you will find that your CO will drop. Okay, you can see this is the driving force. So the bigger the difference between these two, the more will get transferred. Very important to see to see that. I'm going to say that again. The bigger difference between saturation and the concentration in the reactor of oxygen, the more oxygen can be transferred. So if you start needing oxygen, you'll see CO will drop. Okay, CO will drop so that the whole term become bigger. And then at, at its maximum, and this is very important, I can do this, at its maximum C0 will become, a C of oxygen, the concentration of oxygen will become zero. So the maximum possible um, driving force for mass transfer will be the mass transfer coefficient multiplied by the saturation coefficients. That gets to situations where the bugs are really consuming it all. The oxygen concentration dies to zero and uh, you're at maximum mass transfer, but typically the bugs won't be happy because they're not getting all the oxygen that they require. Now, let's have a look at the two fish examples. Um, the big fish will require more oxygen. So the question here is if we measure the oxygen concentration here, and we measure the oxygen concentration here, it's important to understand the oxygen concentration here will be much lower than over here. Why is that the case? Well, it's because you have a big oxygen consumption within the mixture, and therefore you need to supply. You can't supply faster. The supply, the KLA value will be the same. So to try and compensate for the fact that you need to supply more, you will drop CO. The CO will drop so that you can supply faster so that the, the, there's a bigger driving force. But typically it will go, and for the big fish, it will go all the way close to zero, C0. Zero. You'll be at the maximum, but that maximum transfer rate might still not be the same as the volumetric reaction rate of oxygen, the volumetric consumption rate of oxygen driven by the fish. And that's why the fish start suffering. While in this case, you have two small organisms. They don't require a lot of oxygen. So your CO will typically only drop a little bit in order to supply them with the amount that they need. And it will stay fixed there. Okay, so biomass concentration and oxygen concentration, very important. This becomes all important when we have a look at growth and maintenance. You're very familiar with growth and maintenance now. And, uh, you know, the first part of the equation is exactly like before. You'll see in the batch reactor, CS remains quite high, and we're more interested in the effect of oxygen, while in the continuous examples, both will play a role. But just have a look. The oxygen monore term is exactly the same as the substrate term. Obviously, that will be a different constant, but the monore relationship that you know well exactly applies for oxygen concentration. Okay. Um, very important, and you'll notice in this work, is that the K, the oxygen monor constant for maintenance will be much smaller than the oxygen constant, uh, the, uh, the um, monor constant for growth. Okay, that is really because practically what happens to an organism, if the oxygen really gets less, it only it gets less oxygen in, it's definitely going to spend all of its oxygen first on maintenance. And if there's extra, it's going to convert it to growth. Okay, that's why if we make this constant very small, even at low concentrations of oxygen, you still have more or less a constant maintenance. You'll be still close to the um, 
the theta max value. Okay, and you'll see that all of this in your calculations. I just want to take you through what you should get when you run the simulation. Have a look at what's happening over here. Uh, my oxygen concentration there was just starting, and you can see I started at a value, but it immediately settles to a higher value, and then it starts dropping. The oxygen concentration starts dropping as the biomass concentration starts increasing. That's exactly the way we talked about the fishes. And then as the oxygen concentration becomes very low, you, re you reach that point of maximum mass transfer, you'll find that growth almost terminates. So you can't grow any further because there's not enough oxygen to grow. There is, of course, a lot of oxygen, but you will find that most of that oxygen, if you over here, will be used for maintenance. That's why this graph is so important. What I'm trying to plot here is the moles of ATP per cmol per day um, used for growth and used for maintenance. We just got to multiply mu with delta to get the same units. That's the energy, the, you know, the ATP amount. And you will see that the maintenance remains constant. Even though the oxygen really drops, it won't drop to exactly zero. The maintenance will stay the same because, because of the K theta value for the oxygen mineral constant being much smaller. But what happens to growth? You can see here that the energy contribution to growth really decreases. So maintenance keeps on using the same amount of energy. That's kind of like Ben's 9,000 kilojoules a day. You need a certain amount of energy to maintain yourself. But the extra that can be used for growth is now really getting sacrificed. Okay, you can see I was close to the maximum over here. But as my oxygen demand becomes a problem, my mu expression will drive me to a point where mu becomes really very low. And that's why the biomass, of course, if, it's, if, if mu is close to zero, biomass won't grow. And that's how you interpret these figures. You'll generate them, important to analyze, understand, and interpret them. Okay, so that's it. Just a short little help. Towards the end of this um, tutorial, I'm going to ask you, you know, one thing we're going to change is the KLA value. We put in a bigger sparger. We'll see how conversion just happens much faster. Or the other thing we can do is we can change the dilution rate. If we change the dilution rate, we effectively changing the size or the relative size of the reactor. So if we assume that Q, the, the volumetric flow rate coming in, is constant, a uh, bigger D you know, or, or rather I would say a bigger hydraulic retention time or a smaller D will imply a bigger reactor. That's important because we pay for big reactors. Smaller reactors are cheaper. So there's two things in this reactor that will influence the cost. It is how good your sparging is or how big your reactor is. And it's going to be, you know, your choice. What's going to give you the most money by making the sparger better or by making the reactor bigger because you're processing a certain amount of volumetric flow rate coming in. Very important to, start to understand um, oxygen mass transfer as it has a huge effect on conversion and you will see it in, uh, in this specific tutorial. Good luck, enjoy it, we'll be there to help you.